Thanks, everyone. Um, so welcome back to CHM, please. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It was um, March 4th, 2020, when I was last standing here. And on that day, I had a chance to interview Stephen Levy, who had just released a book about Facebook. Um, and I was looking at my remarks that set up that conversation. It was the first forum that I had been leading as an interviewer where we as a museum had christened our new mission and purpose. And that was two years ago. I've been here about four years now, almost to the day. So half of my time has been elsewhere. So this is a very, uh, for me, a very important moment. And for all of you, welcome back and thank you for your support. It turns out it's about 736 days ago that all of those things happened, but you know, nobody's counting, right? <laughs> Um, and it's been difficult for us and all of you as individuals and with families and friends and the cultural institutions in particular have been under an immense amount of stress. Um, by all accounts, uh, up to a third will probably fail as a result of what's happened over the last couple of years. We've done reasonably well, thanks to you uh, and many others who aren't here today, but our trustees, uh, our donors, uh, broad membership base, uh, and various foundations and corporations that have been supporting us over time. So I want to thank all of you very, very much for your support. And if you're so moved, you can always go to our website. There's a little give button up there, which we really appreciate. <laughs> so with that, um, I'm stealing one of the traditions that Marguerite instituted at the institution some years ago now, and I'd like to have it teed up on the screen. There are five numbers that, that I would like to speak to uh, that are kind of referencing things that have happened uh, over the last two years, things we've been up to. Um, like most of you, we've been doing things virtually, so we've got 10,000 hours of virtual meetings that we have held in the last two years. <laughs> we've been continuing to collect our oral histories. One of the core assets of the institution is a collection of nearly 1,000 oral histories. And as most of you know, because this is a crowd that cares a fair amount about venture capital, um, it's the definitive collection of oral histories from the venture capital community as well. Um, we received that collection not too, too long ago. Uh, and uh, it's a nice basis uh, from which we've added 60 new oral histories in the last couple of years. So we haven't slowed down on that front. Virtual events, we've been continuing to run uh, 35 or so of those. And for those who are not aware, we've been redoing all the technical infrastructure of the institution. Beyond repositioning and repurposing uh, our agenda, uh, we have been thinking through and implementing an architecture uh, for 21st century museums, galleries, libraries, and archives. So we've been working on an architecture uh, and have implemented over 15 new systems in the last two years as well. So we're real serious about it. It will operationalize things from the cloud and effectively build a programmable institution. Uh, and as many of you may have seen in one of our recent uh, fellow event programs, we've got a scan of this institution, the physical space, and a meaningful percentage of the exhibit that's been scanned as well. So we're, we're thinking about the future and how to operationalize everywhere locally in local language and in real time as appropriate. So uh, if not us, who? Um, so. We're working on that. Um, and for those, in some cases, uh, a little smaller than those, or at least age appropriate, Minecraft. We launched a Minecraft environment with Microsoft a little while ago, and we've got other things going on in the digital world as well like that. And there's one other thing that's not up there that's a one, and that's, that's, the, that's me. I'm, I'm the one CEO of the museum, and I'm really happy. So I want to say that's another thing that's really good. So. Um, as we emerge uh, from this moment, or seven, 736 days of moments, whatever they are, um, our mission to decode technology, its computing past, the digital present, and the future impact on humanity to shape a better future is what we're all about. And as a kickoff program for reopening the institution for our programming, uh, what better opportunity than to have 
Marguerite introduce uh, the panel and the program tonight, which is really all about growth and exponential growth and, and suspending disbelief in the moment, placing bets, and then watching the world change. So I'm going to hand it off to Marguerite Gong Hancock, who's the leader of this program and the director of uh, innovation and the exponential center at the museum. So Marguerite, thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. It's so wonderful to be back in person. I want to add my warm welcome to each of you here to be back together as part of the CHM community in person, and also to our virtual audiences who are, I know are joining us around the Bay Area, Boston, and beyond. So welcome to all of you. Uh, we're excited to have this kick off a new season of programming. And on the back of your programs, you'll see that we have five events coming up in the next few weeks. So please join us for everything from eSports and AI to Silicon Valley Soul and Stuart Brand and the Lost Women of Science. So continue to join us here. Uh, as Daniel said, the museum has now the leading collection of venture capitalists, um, VC oral histories, and it's been built over decades by scholars and uh, our curators and many industry leaders. We have dozens of oral histories that our own team has collected, as well as we brought into the collection a um, seminal group of oral histories from the NVCA and Venture Forward, which are now stewarded here. And uh, we also have our event recordings. Evenings like tonight, we consider something we curate in our historic value, and so we have many people who have been on stage uh, here at the museum, and also we've brought in, during this pandemic time, the Churchill Club recordings, which are now part of our collection. So whether a panel with uh, trailblazers, some of whom are here tonight, um, who've been on our stage, like Pitch Johnson and Dick Kramlick and uh, Bill Draper, who we did an event with, or oral history uh, interviews with VC um, on the East Coast, like Venerox Peter Crisp, or Gray Cross uh, Alan Patrickoff, um, or NEA's Chuck Newhall, who are watching tonight, or interviews of founders and funders together, like Gordon Moore with Art Rock, or a fireside chat with Reed Hoffman, um, or Hans Tong, or Anne Murico. We feel it's a pleasure and a special responsibility for us to capture these, preserve them for history, make them accessible freely to everybody, uh, to in, and also to use them to inspire the next generation. Don't miss the chance, if you haven't had it already, to look at our special pop-up exhibit of some of the highlights from our VC collection. You'll see uh, some of the clips from our oral histories, some special business plans, um, an early one of digital computer um, going to ARDC from 1957, business, uh, the Apple um, business plan and others. You'll see some of the roots of iconic firms um, there with pitch decks, as well as some fun things like um, some uh, entrepreneurial games. So, And uh, also our one word uh, portraits of VCs. And you'll have a chance to choose your one word. So choose a good word and put it up for display. Those are just some highlights from our collection for the VC initiative. And you can learn more on our website. So a special appreciation to so many of you who are joining us tonight and who will be on stage, who are part of this venture capital uh, initiative. Um, it's something that we are not only preserving from history, but actively growing. And in that spirit, we were thrilled in 2018 when Sebastian Malaby joined as a distinguished scholar here at the museum for the Exponential Center. While he was an affiliate, he conducted research out of the archives, uh, joined me for an oral history, uh, did a study uh, session with early draft of his book and uh, contributed to the community here. So it's a special pleasure to welcome him back now to see the fruits of his work. So tonight's program will have two parts. First, Sebastian will share some of the key insights from his new book, The Power Law of Venture Capital. And then he'll be joined on stage with uh, three amazing people, Rolof Botha from Sequoia, uh, Cowboy Ventures' Aileen Lee, and then also um, Stanford historian Leslie Berlin. So following our tradition, let me introduce Sebastian using five numbers. 35 years reporting on global shifts in technology, finance, and politics. 25, the age when he watched Nelson Mandela walk out of jail. 1992, the year he acquired a Science Series 3 personal digital assistant. Five books written, 
and 2004, the year he became a naturalized citizen. He is a Paul Volcker Senior Fellow for International Economics at the Council of Foreign Le Relations. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Sebastian Alby. Good to have you here. Thank you. Well, thanks for that introduction, and great to be here. I've, I've flown in from London a few days ago, and it's so nice to be able to travel. For any of you who are worried about being at a dangerous public event, I can reassure you, because our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has said that COVID is over, and he never lies. <laughs> so we're, 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 we're all good. Um, so I'm going to start with a story. I was, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, a venture capitalist in India had read my book, and he wanted to get in touch. We had a Zoom call, and he runs, uh, he's a partner with Axel uh, in, in Bangalore. And um, so he told me a bit about himself. He said that he had spent some time in the US, he'd worked at Intel, he'd done an engineering degree, he'd done a business MBA, and then he'd come back to Bangalore in 2010, and he had started to make some investments. So I said, good, well, you know, that's from 2010 to now, I'm curious about how the venture landscape might have changed in the interim. And he said, well, yeah. In 2010, I made an investment, and then a bit after that, the founder comes to me and he says he needs some help. So I'm a venture capitalist. I say, sure, I'm here to help. What can I help with? And the founder says, I want to get married. So the venture capitalist says, you want to get married? So why are you talking to me? You want to marry me? What's that? <laughs> no, 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 no. I have a girlfriend. I want to marry her, but her father doesn't want it to go ahead because I'm an entrepreneur, and an entrepreneur, in his view, is a loser. But you, Mr. Venture Capitalist, you have standing. You have been to the United States. You've worked for Intel. You've had a good business degree from MIT. You can persuade my prospective father-in-law if you phone him up and say, listen, you know, venture capital is, is here to back the guy. Your entrepreneur is not a loser. Your daughter should be allowed to marry this fine young man. So the VC makes the call, the marriage goes ahead, it's all good. And then I say, so, 10 years later, do you still make this kind of call? Are you still providing you know, marriage facilitation intermedi intermediation? <laughs> and my friend, the Axel venture capitalist says, no, 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 I don't need to do that anymore because these days all the prospective father-in-laws are watching Shark Tank <laughs> in Hindi. Uh, and so there's a serious point to this story, um, which is that culture changes. You can have a place that is essentially a bit hostile and suspicious vis-a-vis -vis entrepreneurship in 2010, and rather positive and supportive uh, a decade later. Culture changes. You can create a culture in which entrepreneurship and venture capital are kind of part of the fabric. And in the brief moments I've got with you before we do the main thing, the panel, that's the message I want you to take away. Culture is not uh, static. Since my book has come out, I've had a chance to give talks really all over, um, some by Zoom, some in person. I've done some in London. And when I tell people that I'm optimistic that venture capital can change culture, I get a lot of pushback. You know, people in London, people in Europe say, oh, no, no, it's not going to work here. You know, yeah, we, we've got some good engineers. We've got some decent universities. Yeah, OK, we've got a good consumer market. But we still can't do venture capital or entrepreneurship here. And I'm like, why? And they say, well, it's, you know, we just don't believe in risk. We don't believe that you know, if you fail, that could be a learning experience. Whatever that stuff is that they are drinking out there in Silicon Valley when they drink the water, we don't have that here. And my answer to this is that, what do you think Silicon Valley was like before it was called Silicon Valley? What was it like in the 1950s, right, or the 1960s? It was a, a world of you know, big business, big labor, big everything, big government. And the expectation was that you joined a company, you served it loyally, you retired with a gold watch when you retired at 60. And that culture began to be changed when Fairchild Semiconductor was established. And many people know this story. It's brilliantly told, by the way, in uh, Leslie Berlin's uh, book about uh, uh, Bob Noyce. She's just sitting over here, and she'll be on the stage in a minute. So shout out for Leslie. Uh, and people know this story well, but the little bit that I've tried to add to the story is to show how the formation of the Fairchild, uh, of Fairchild Semiconductor, and by the way, also of Intel, uh, which was spun out of Fairchild um, about 11 years later. This owes more to venture capital than one might suppose. We're, we're familiar with books about entrepreneurs, 
We're familiar with books about inventors, but the financing is important as well. And the story about Fairchild is that there had been these, these engineers who were working for Shockley, uh, who was a brilliant inventor, but a terrible, terrible guy to work for. And they were fed up with him. They wanted to go and found, you know, start another company. They didn't have the idea of founding a company because entrepreneurship was not yet an accepted idea. And so they, they, they wrote to a broker on the East Coast and said, well, you're a broker. You know lots of companies. Maybe you can tell us which company would be willing to hire us as a team. And the broker flew out to the West Coast to meet with him. He was called Arthur Rock. I hope he's watching this on uh, Zoom right now. Hello, Arthur. Um, and um, he flew out, and, and he said to them, listen, don't just join another company. Start your own company. And they're like, well, we don't have any money to do that. Arthur Rock says, well, I'll raise the money for you. And then they think about it, and there's an evident problem, which they don't really have a leader in the group. So Arthur Rock encourages them to choose somebody who could be the leader. They choose Bob Noyce. And so in this way, uh, you know, Fairchild, which might not have been founded otherwise, comes to be. And Gordon Moore, who was later then the co-founder of Intel and was one of this group that founded Fairchild, later described himself as an accidental entrepreneur. It's a remarkable statement if you think about it. I mean, Gordon Moore founded, uh, was one of the founders at Fairchild, a co-founder of Intel, a storied person in Silicon Valley. Even the name associated with Moore's Law is, is, is so familiar and so well recognized. And yet he's calling himself an accidental entrepreneur. He says, I wouldn't have done it unless somebody had pushed me. And the person who pushed him was the venture capitalist, was Arthur Rock. And in this way, Arthur Rock liberated Gordon Moore from corporate servitude. Uh, and, and that's why I call venture capital, at the beginning of my book, liberation capital. And I think that story about the formation of Fairchild is just one little taste of how venture capital can sort of de-risk some of the business of entrepreneurship. Not all of it, of course. It's still a grueling and, 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 and tough process, and hats off to the tough people who do it. But it is de-risk from the point of view of being kind of really a crazy thing to do, where you wouldn't let your daughter marry the guy, uh, to something that's you know, worth a shot. Um, if you think about it, you, know, you have somebody at a, uh, at a big company who has an idea, an engineer halfway up the hierarchy. And in an environment without venture capital, if the boss of that person doesn't like the idea, the idea will be stifled. It will be wasted. You won't be able to do something if the boss doesn't like it. Maybe the boss doesn't like it. Maybe the boss is actually scared of it because the idea is going to disrupt the company which already has a bunch of other products out there. But if you add venture capital into the mix, then the engineer, if the engineer is frustrated, can leave the company, get funding, and pursue that experiment in a new kind of applied science uh, you know, without being in the big company. And if you just gain this through for a moment, you, you, you imagine this conversation between the engineer who's thinking about leaving and the venture capitalist, and the engineer says, well, I don't have the capital to do a company. And the, and the venture capitalist says, sure, I've got that covered. And then the engineer says, yeah, but I haven't founded a company before. I don't know how to grow a company. I don't know how to manage it, incorporate it. You know, there's going to be all sorts of things along the way that I won't be familiar with. And the venture capitalist says, well, you know, I've backed many companies before. I'll partner with you, and I'm going to help you. I'll make it less dangerous, less risky, and I'll be with you in, in the trenches. So then the, uh, the entrepreneur thinks about this and says, yeah, but I mean, to build this product I'm thinking of, I'm going to need five other great engineers to come and join me. And the venture capitalist says, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to help you to interview them. And I know people in my network that you might consider. And then the entrepreneur says, OK, but you know, for this great people who are, already have jobs at Google or whatever, you know, they're well paid. They're having a good time. It's very secure. Why are they going to take a risk on joining a small startup? Startups fail a lot. And the venture capitalist says, sure, of course they fail a lot. But I'm going to tell them that this is a good startup, and also that if it does fail, I back plenty of companies. Failure is not going to be held against you, and I'll help you to get the next job. I always remember being told by Eric Schmidt the story of how he thought about it when he was recruited to join Google as the chief executive. Even though Google had a great product, it was very early days. You couldn't be sure of the success. And plus, you know what? Larry and Sergey were kind of, they had a certain attitude to people aged over 30. They weren't sure they respected people you know, who had a couple of gray hairs. 
And so Eric Schmidt, coming into Google, was worried that he would be bounced out of Google as fast as he arrived. So he talked to John Doerr, one of the VCs involved, and he said, you know, I, do I want to risk my career on this? I've, I've been a CEO at Intuit. Why would I go run this tiny little search company with these people who have a bit of attitude? And John Doerr says, Eric, if you do this and you get bounced out by the young punks, I'll find you another job somewhere else. And so venture capital is not taking risk out of the system. There's no taking risk out of entrepreneurship. But it is somewhat de-risking it to the point where it's possible to imagine more people taking that jump, both the founders of companies and the early people who then join the companies. So that's the message I'd like you to, to take away. I, uh, you know, I could tell you lots of things about my book. It's, it's essentially you're doing two things. It's a story about how people allocate capital at the very early stage, which is sort of an intellectual mystery, right? I mean, in most kinds of investing, there are quantitative guidelines, price earnings ratios, what have you. In venture, there are none of those. So I'm trying to grapple with that mystery. I'm also uh, trying to talk about the impact of venture capital on the world. Um, and we'll be talking about those things just now uh, on the panel. But for now, I just want to leave you with this idea that you know, venture capital can change business culture. Venture capital can liberate talent. Venture capital is a machine for manufacturing courage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Now, continue our introductions. We'll have a panel join. I want to mention that you have cards on your chairs. And as you think of questions, please go ahead and write them down. Our team will be collecting them and sharing with the moderator. So continuing our introductions. Uh, next, uh, we have Rulof Botha. And here are his five numbers. 28 was the year, uh, the age when he took PayPal public as CFO. 10, the number of companies worked uh, with that have gone public. Infinity, the Sequoia Cap um, since Sequoia Capital removes all artificial time horizons on how, to long, how long to partner with companies. And 10 to the ninth, his personal goal to deliver $1 billion in total gains to Sequoia since he began working at the firm. By the way, he realized that in 2015. And uh, 90603, his wedding date. He is a partner at Sequoia Capital. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. Next, Eileen Lee, and here are her five numbers. Nine years since starting Cowboy Ventures, 20 years investing, 99 early stage investments made at Cowboy, three kids, and 19 years married to her husband, Jason. It feels like how many? Is it 18 or is it 19? OK, 18 years married to husband, Jason. She's the founder of Cowboy Ventures. Give a very warm welcome to Eileen. <laughs> to lead this conversation, we're so delighted to welcome back to the CHM stage, Leslie Berlin. Leslie is a historian who's chronicled the rise of tech, culture, its influential figures, and also the story of Silicon Valley. She now chairs the advisory group uh, for the Silicon Valley Archives at Stanford. She pre previously wrote the prototype column in the New York Times Sunday Business um, section, and her work's been featured in everything from the Wall Street Journal to Wired. She's the author of two books. Sebastian already mentioned one, The Man Behind the Microchip, about Bob Noyce, uh, and also Troublemakers, an exploration of how Silicon Valley in the 1970s, set the stage to change our world. Over to you, Leslie. We're so glad to have you back here at CTM. Hello, everyone. It is really wonderful to be here in person. Um, and it's especially exciting to be on a panel. I was realizing this is the first time ever that someone else has chosen the panelists, and two of them our friends that I've had over to dinner, and um, it's just been delightful. And Rulof, you have a standing invite <laughs> anytime you <laughs> want to come over. Um, and Sebastian, congratulations on the book. Um, whenever you have a friend who publishes a book, as you know, because I'm sure you have a lot, you have that moment of terror where you're just like, please, please let it be good, because <laughs> you don't know what you're going to say if it's not. Um, it's excellent. Um, so it's excellent. congratulations on that. Uh, so the way this is going to work is that we are going to chat 
uh, the three, the four of us, but mostly those three, um, for the next half hour or so. And then we'll be opening it up um, to audience questions. And I am just going to jump right in. Um, and you guys, just so you know, this clock is way off. The time is 7.25. Um, and we will be wrapping up in about half an hour. Um, so the first question I had, actually, I thought I'd start with you, Aileen. Um, but I'm hoping everyone will answer all the questions and also that you guys will just ask each other questions. I'm just, I'm like the prime mover here and then you guys get going. Um, so Sebastian's book is full of stories of audacity. I mean, it opens with the great story of impossible foods where a Stanford geneticist decides, oh, I'm gonna just disrupt a trillion and a half dollar meat industry and um, in the process he launches this company that's now worth about seven billion dollars. <throat> And you also tell the stories of companies like WeWork and Uber and Theranos, um, in which, and here I'm quoting you, founders who thought themselves accountable to nobody cut ethical corners with investors, employees, and customers alike paying the price. And um, one of the things that Rulof and I were talking about um, a couple days ago was sort of the role of active investors versus passive investors. and. Um, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit, all of you, about how you see your role um, as active investors, often in companies with very inexperienced uh, founders, but just in general, how, how do you think about what your responsibilities are in that capacity? You really want me to start? Yes. <laughs> um, what a well, friend's fault. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think... Uh, well, I'm curious to see what you say, but I, you know, I'm very fortunate because I was trained at Kleiner Perkins, and you write about Kleiner Perkins quite a bit in your book, and, and uh, Kleiner Perkins is one of the OG venture firms that was really a built on service and on um, being of service to founders and kind of what we call now full stack service, right? Do you need help with product? Do you need help with finance? Do you need help with hiring? Do you need help with moving? Do you need help with interviewing someone? Do you need help with talking into, it's like talking to someone's fiance's father? Like, I'm there, you know, it's, if it's, you know, it's the weekend, it's night, uh, being of service to founders was really, I think was how I was trained. And uh, I do believe that um, you know, capital, especially in today's market, is really ev available in a lot of different ways. And so um, you know, the personal rapport that you build with the founding team, the things that you do to help them, um, and, and, and kind of to the beginning of your question, I think your values and being values aligned with the founders and helping them see around corners and like, take smart risks and avoid dumb risks. Uh, is important and avoiding ethical risk is, you know, sadly something that we have to actually talk about um, because of a lot of recent things. Um, but it's also, to be honest, there's also, you know, a history of a lot of very successful startups cutting corners to kind of be able to leapfrog. So it's a very fine balance. Mm -hmm. It's challenging because the best founders have a reality distortion field. And the best ones pull it off. And part of what you have to figure out is, are they lying or are they just painting a picture of the future? And to your question about values alignment, I think it's a lot of what you need to do in diligence to understand who you're getting into business with, making sure you do proper references. Um, we sometimes invest in companies where we've known them for a week, and sometimes we've known them for a decade. And so it's difficult when you have that compressed timeline to make good decisions about the value system. I got involved with a company two years ago that came out of Stanford, and the two founders actually had a, the equivalent of a marriage contract, they had a founder contract with each other, which I absolutely loved, where they, they spelled out the value system that they were going to have with each other, and when we got involved with them, they asked me if I would sign a contract too, that there would be a founder-investor contract about the code of conduct. And I thought it was a wonderful innovation um, that I want to take to many more new investments to create that alignment of interest, because okay. ultimately we are responsible to all the shareholders of the company. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's difficult. No doubt. I, th I think the complexity comes sometimes when you can start like that, but then later stage investors come in. And um, particularly since 2009, uh, which was when um, DST came into the valley and invested in Facebook at a late stage, because uh, in 2008, with the crisis, it was very hard to raise capital. So an outsider like Yuri Milner 
could fly into San Francisco, go down to the sort of Palo Alto Starbucks, meet with the CFO of Facebook, and talk his way into a meeting and do the investment. And part of what he was offering was, I won't go on your board. I don't want a board seat. I will vote my shares with you, the founder. And that's a model that's been followed by late stage investors. And if they bring in enormous amounts of capital, dilute the early investors, and then the founders get super voting shares, mm -hmm. um, governance is kind of gone. And I worry that on the one hand, you have a public market governance model where you have chief executives who report to public shareholders. If he does something or she does something that looks dumb, the shareholders will dump the stock. They could even short the stock. You have the quarterly earnings calls and all that stuff. So that kind of works, not great, but it sort of works. And then you've got early stage companies where there are activist, hands-on venture investors. That's another kind of governance that works. But I'm a bit worried about the unicorn space where not clear there is a governance mechanism the, that works. The, public, uh, the, the private unicorn space. So before they have the accountability of being public. Yeah, they have neither the um, traditional early stage venture hands-on governance mm -hmm. because the early people have been diluted too much, and nor do they have the public market governance. They're in that middle spot. My sense is, but I, I'd be interested to hear what you think, that that's where there may be a problem. Yes. <laughs> uh, Jack Dorsey came to one of our uh, Sequoia events recently, and he talked in front of all of our founders about how he's concerned with the amount of euro worship, essentially, that Silicon Valley has had for founders. And you know, your book is refreshing in the sense that it talks about the role that venture capital plays. I mean, these days, you know, you almost have to hush. You know, what do you do for a living? Venture capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's really just, just swung too far because the truth is that these successful companies are really the amalgam of so many different actors. Mm -hmm. It's, of course, it's the founders. That's where the idea begins. But it's the, the freedom capital, the, the, the ability to get venture financing. It's the early engineers. It's the designers. It's the finance people, the salespeople, everybody that goes into this beautiful orchestra. And yet there's only one person or one class of person who's being celebrated. And that causes the problem. And so I do think we need a reset in that for the health of the system. Do you think it comes down to the economics? Like if founders, because founders make all the money. Is they don't that make a lot of money. They make a lot of well? They make. I mean, if you have a successful exit, they generally have most of the equity, right? Like, is that? Do you think that's how attached is the founder worship to that? Well, so again, Jack led an incredible example. So uh, twice at Square in our block, and I believe he did this at Twitter as well. He gave back one percent of the company from his own shares to fund the pool to enable the company to hire the people it needed for the company to succeed. Mm -hmm. And the contrast to that is, you know, obviously many founders don't take additional equity, but now you have founders who just want re-ups the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so there's this real imbalance between, you know, are you really acting like an owner? Mm -hmm. And do you really care about the success of the business or do you care about self-enrichment? And yeah. some of that you need to assess when you first meet a founder and understand how obsessed they are with the vision and the mission for their company, or how much they're in it for mercenary purposes. I think part of what's been driving this whole shift is, is software, right? I mean. Um, if you go back to the early story of venture capital, uh, the projects tended to be semiconductors or routers or building personal computers. It was more capital intensive, more capital was needed, therefore the capitalists. How much capital did Uber burn? Hmm? How much capital did Uber burn? How much capital did we okay. burn? How much? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that. The amount of money spent on sales and marketing to grow these businesses. Right. No, that's completely right. And that's why you know, the later stage investors have power, because they're providing the billions that get burned. But to get to product, to get to product market fit with hardware, I think you'd agree, is, you know, take, is more capital intensive than it is with software. And so. Um, in the early part of my book, founders are taking, you know, in the case of an extreme example, 77% of the company when they invest a Series A, it quickly goes to 45%, then it's a third. Then by Google, we've got down to a quarter. By Facebook, we've got down to one-eighth. So there's this gradual yeah. decline in the amount of, uh, of the company that Series A investors are taking. And that kind of mirrors, you know, both a shift in power because capital is plentiful, but also a shift in power because the founder needs less capital. I think there's also a shift in technical risk. I mean, in the early uh, 
days of venture capital, there was a lot more technical risk, right? And that's why you had a lot more engineers who actually had a lot of experience, like 20, 30 years of engineering experience being the VCs because they could assess the technical risk. Mm -hmm. Because in software now, to be honest, there's not as much, you know, coding is you know, not as hard as designing circuits in different ways. Uh, so I think that's changed quite a bit too. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a lot more people who can actually be VCs. And then obviously in the beginning of VC, like there, you know, not everyone understood what a good business venture capital was. So the capital was a lot more concentrated in the hands of a few firms. And as more people, as their success became more public, more people said, I want to be a VC too. And people got more choices. Right. All right. <laughs> we can keep going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, um, does anyone have anything else they want to add? <laughs> okay. We want more questions. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question. Um, you're going to detect a pattern here where I say Sebastian said, "What do you think?" Um, that I'm reading Sebastian here. Women account for only 16% of investing partners at VC firms. Black investors account for only 3%. An industry that involves subjective judgments about startup founders is wide open to bias and should stress diversity all the more. Without progress on this front, people of a certain type will fund people of a certain type. The venture industry is a meritocracy up to a point. It is also what its critics call a mirrortocracy. And Sebastian also notes that among VCs with MBAs, a third attended either Stanford or Harvard. Um, and my question, and I'll, I'll start with you, Ruloff, is uh, A, do you agree with what Sebastian is saying here? And B, how do, you, how do you think about this issue? So we're in the business of attracting opportunities, making decisions, and then helping with company building. And obviously, we have to build our own partnership. When you think about the importance of decision making, a lot has been written about and researched on the value of having diverse groups of people to make decisions. Sometimes diverse groups aren't useful. If, if you know exactly what you need to do, it, it's actually not as valuable. But when, in, in the nature of our job, diversity of functional backgrounds, uh, educational backgrounds, where you are from the world, I mean, it, it's all to the benefit of making great decisions. And so we've always strived for that. Um, I can tell you when I joined Sequoia, we had zero females on our investing team. Today, 25% of our team is female. Um, so that has changed. There's no target. It's just we continue to find great people. The challenge that I found when I got to Sequoia is that the industry largely tapped its existing networks. And if you just think about that logically, that will self-perpetuate. I'd worked at PayPal. Michael Moritz was on our board. So when we got acquired by eBay, he asked me if I'd interview. So, you're just going to perpetuate that system unless you reach into new networks. And that's precisely what we did to, to try to address this imbalance. Mm -hmm. and how did you find your new networks? You go meet new people. You find out, you know, the first uh, person we recruited, Jess Lee, had worked, uh, had started a company that wasn't a Sequoia back company. But I heard her speak at a conference. I was really impressed. I went out of my way to go meet her. I met her for lunch a couple of times here in Mountain View, downtown Mountain View. Tried to recruit her. She said no. Um, and a year later, we reconnected. And even though we hadn't backed her, we took time to build a relationship with her to the point that she was interested in joining our partnership. Um, Rudolf, I think you're missing a chance here to tell the story. I know. I was going to say, I, you have to tell the story of how you <laughs> oh, guys how we, how we convinced. So, I love that story. So, so part of what Jess was concerned about when she was interviewing with us was whether we would accept her for who she is. Um, and she loves cosplay. So she will often go to the show in San Diego and, and dress up. And so we knew this about her. So my partner, Jim, and I uh, got costumes. I am so bummed we weren't uh, there. We, would you have we loved have... to be there? <laughs> So we were uh, Buzz Lightyear and Woody from uh, Toy Story. And it's these costumes with these massive heads that they would have on street parades or something. It was very stiflingly hot to sit inside this thing. And Jim tricked me because I was supposed to be Woody. And last minute, he said, no, you're the young upstart. You're going to be Buzz Lightyear, which really annoyed me. So, anyway, so we sit in a coffee shop. So you shop. could breathe and you could not. <laughs> but, but, but she couldn't see us. Because so, oh, she you, had these yeah, massive she, heads over us. Walked into. Yes, yeah, so, so we were right? sitting in the Pete's Coffee Shop uh, in Los Altos, and she walks in, and we're sitting, sitting there, and she just looks at us. It's like, this is weird. And I could see her discreetly taking her phone and taking a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdos at the coffee shop. <laughs> so she doesn't recognize us. Then we hold up a picture that one of our partners had drawn of JC, the character in Toy Story that's the female cowboy. Oh, cute. And the headline says, Wanted. 
And so then she looks over at us, and then we take off our heads and show that it's us. And that to her was an illustration that we would accept of who she is. And she's a general partner at Sequoia now. I love that story. It's <laughs> an awesome, awesome story. Aileen, do you have something to add on this area? Um, you know, uh, reading the, the book, The Power Law, which I think is such an important uh, insight, right, about kind of compounding, the value of compounding interest in a way, and, uh, and networks, right? You talk a lot in the book about networks and how it can really amplify or accelerate your success. But unfortunately, then that's, that is what has happened in venture capital, which is the power law of personal networks and the power law of success by largely white men in venture capital caused more white men to be recruited and for more white men to be backed by venture capitalists. And it just kept getting more and more powerful. And then, so it's really hard for outsiders to catch up. I think the, the positive thing, I mean, I actually think the numbers may actually be worse than what you cited in terms of the number of women and people of color and other types of underrepresented minorities in, in venture. But we talk about it now. We never used to talk. 10 years ago, it was not a topic. Now, people like Ruloff care about, you know, care about, I mean, you've always cared about this, but um, previous generations of venture and founders, I think, weren't sensitive to it. It was kind of a like, don't make us uncomfortable because that will make it worse kind of a situation. Uh, so I'm encouraged by the fact that we, we're, you write about it, you're studying it, and we're all trying to do something about it. So that gives me a lot of, we can't let up because it's a marathon and I think we're like in mile two, uh, but we have a shot. It's a modestly hopeful sign that if you look at a um, venture ecosystem that grew up later, i.e. China, uh, it has better representation of women. And in a sort of slight digression, the other thing about China is that it's not geographically concentrated in the same way that Silicon Valley dominated the system here in the US. Mm -hmm. You've got you know, some venture in Beijing, some in Shanghai, some in Hangzhou, some in Hong Kong. And I think that might also be in both ways, both the mm -hmm. geographic spread and the gender balance. Not quite a balance in China, but it's better than here. That could tell us something about where we'll go. That would be nice. That'd be good. I know there's some recent some recent announcements still that make that remind us that there's a long way to go. <laughs> okay, that was the perfect segue for my next question, um, which is about the spread of venture capital um, internationally. And I wanted to, to I started thinking, um, if you look at the early years of this century, which is just the data I happen to have at hand, um, more than half of the uh, startups in the United States had a founder born, at least one, born outside of the United States. More than 70% had a key person in leadership who was born outside of the United States. So very clearly, the constant inflow of people, of immigrants to the US um, has been essential, you know. Um, and around the exact same time as that particular slice that I just was talking about, we've had American venture capital companies investing in truly significant ways outside of the United States and setting up um, operations outside of the United States um, to the point that you write quite a bit about China um, and specifically about how that flywheel is now going to the point that you have a, a, a completely homegrown sort of venture capital industry coming up there. And I guess I'm wondering, um, and I'm sorry that we didn't talk about this in advance, you guys. It just, just occurred to me when I was chatting with my husband earlier today. If you have any thoughts about holding these two things in balance and where you think they might be going in that we have had these ideas um, about how to do venture capital um, and the structures of doing venture capital. We've kind of been exporting these ideas. Um, and at the same time, of course, we want to be a magnet for talent here um, in the United States. So I'm wondering if you've thought about how those sit in balance. Um, yeah, any thoughts? Should I take a crack? I mean, I think that it's true that you know, venture capital and tech generally are facets of national power. So you can think about this you know, cross-pollination that US venture methods go to China, 
Chinese people come to the US, they found startups in the US, that you know, the whole thing can mix up and it kind of just generates you know, more and more prosperity. That's a kind of optimistic view. But you know, starting around whatever, 2017, you've got more, nationalist, more nationalistic leadership, both in the US and in China. And that's created this well-known geopolitical um, competition. And part of that is tech. And if you think about American power, without a company like Intel or Microsoft or whatever, it would be less. If you think about Chinese power without Huawei, it would be less. Um, right now, there's a fight over you know, semiconductor dominance. Um, if Taiwan were to become a flashpoint, the semiconductors in Taiwan, the, the manufacturing proficiency in Taiwan would be you know, probably the most globally important part of that. Um, so it's a facet of national power. And the question is, do we therefore rethink the idea that just everybody moving around and producing you know, more prosperity globally is that a model that we have to challenge in our, in our heads? And I, I kind of grapple this a bit. And I think that, um, in general, I'm still in favor of money moving around and people moving around and talent moving around. The one exception I worry about slightly, and I don't come to this view easily because I'm basically in favor of globalization, but I do think that if you think about foreign, if you think about Chinese nationals investing in American tech companies. We don't need the capital. Chinese nationals might bring connections in China, but since it's difficult to set up a company in China if you're a US tech company, it depends a bit on which sector and all that, but not clear that that's a big advantage. So I think there are questions about the strategic implications of allowing um, the idea collection part of being in the ecosystem to carry, to carry on. I mean, I, I'm Happy to be contradicted, but I, that, that's kind of where I come out. I think you have a lot more global exposure than I do. You should, what do you think? Well, there's so many different issues. I mean, one of them, if you talk about ideas for a second, and it came up in your opening remarks as well, um, ideas is about taking resources and, and coming up with new recipes for doing things. And if those recipes are far more efficient, that leads to faster growth. It's part of why the US grew at about a half percent per annum faster than the UK, when you do that for a century, you end up with a vastly different per capita GDP. So I'm a huge fan of letting ideas spread for how to do company formation and technology in general. And I do think it spills over to everybody's benefit if we do that. To your point about immigration, it's just been hard in the US. You know, with recent administration changes, it's so hard for us to get engineers to be here. I mean, I think if I had come to the US 10 years later or 15 years later, I don't know if I would have been able to stay. And so, so talent is more distributed and opportunity is more distributed than it was before. So I think that the, the natural reaction is to fund companies elsewhere. And so we've established offices in India, China. We have operations in Europe as well. And it's actually fantastic to see that these ideas that are here, that they're spreading all around the world and that people are able to build businesses that affect, you know, whether it's enterprise businesses or consumer businesses in every part of the world. And so I'm loath to let that not continue. And I also wonder to the extent that you try to limit it, whether those ideas are actually there anyway. You know, sometimes people joke about um, IP rights and whether your patents are secure. Well, you know, the chances are if some state-sponsored entity wants to get your, your secrets, they probably have them already. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really know if there's much we can do uh, to prevent that. Maybe. Aileen, do you have anything you want to add on this? I mean, the first thing that came to my mind, I, I, I agree with both of these gentlemen in terms of, I just think you can't, I mean, the power of software is that it really can be used globally and, and, it, and it's accessible and it, it is empowering in so many ways to people in, um, you know, in Tibet and all the all these other places where you can actually make a living wage and use your mind um, when, before when we were closed off and we weren't using software, uh, it was so much more limiting. But I do think, like, I was like, ooh, if, if, imagine the productivity gains if my kids could no longer use TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who funded TikTok next time. Pardon? I might be in favor of that. <laughs> um, I have asked each of you um, to, to think of sort of a, a favorite kind of anecdote or story um, about your work 
and or something that um, you find particularly challenging about it, I think, and actually this is being reinforced by the sorts of questions that I'm seeing here, people kind of want to know what is the lived, what's it like to actually do this work as a venture capitalist? Um, and I would love to hear some of your thoughts on that. And then I'm gonna ask you, Sebastian, also to talk about writing your book, sort of what was a favorite moment and a, perhaps a, a, a challenging one. But let's start with the venture capitalist. You go first. What's it like? Mm-hmm. For a favorite story? For a favorite story. I don't know, I think you, have, you start, you start. You have a favorite story. Uh, so <laughs> I have many. <laughs> yeah. So in 1987, I attended a nerd camp in South Africa, and I met a, a person called Matthew Rabinovitz. And he and I finished high school at the same time in South Africa. He came to the US to Stanford, and he did a physics undergrad and a PhD at Stanford. And when I got to Stanford many years later, he and I reconnected. And I joined Sequoia, and in 2000, and, uh, he had a physics background. In 2006, his sister had a baby that died within a week of birth from a genetic condition that was undetected during her pregnancy because the blood tests that were available were so primitive. And he went back to Stanford and learned everything he could about genetics and biology to try to solve this problem. And we provided a million dollars worth of seed capital to him and his co-founder to see if they can do something about this. And this company has turned into what is now a public company called Natera. They made they did one and a half million tests last year. Um, they're the biggest genetic testing company for maternal health in America. They've also transitioned into cancer screening and to organ transplant rejection screening, but it all started with this incredible individual that I'd met in high school. And so in some sense, I, I started sourcing for Sequoia two decades before <laughs> I joined. <laughs> but to me, it's illustrative of these long-term relationships that sometimes come back uh, to you as an investor and how, you know, one of the catchphrases I have is that friends come and go, enemies accumulate. And you, you never know what's gonna happen next with that relationship that I'd first yeah. cultivated when I was 13 years old that turned into a fabulous investment. And by the way, um, at one point, there's another company I'm involved with called Unity, and the founder was in San Francisco the day be before he pitched Sequoia. And he was trying to figure out uh, which firm he should go with. And at the coffee table next to him in San Francisco was this founder, Matthew. And Matthew overheard the conversation, and he, we'd been in business with him, and he then immediately sang our praises and talked about his personal experience working with me, which helped us clinch that particular investment. So for me, it was just this illustration of networks and people and relationships, and now they come back to you at the end of the day. Yeah, those are great. I'll, sh I'll share a quick one, I guess, on uh, maybe a little bit what it's like. So uh, we had an intern who was at Stanford Business School who uh, told me that she ha had a friend who was working on a business plan, and it was another woman at Stanford Business School. And, uh, and this woman had a lot of passion. She had never worked in tech. She did not know how to code, uh, and she had an idea. She had a lot of passion for everyday workers and for hourly workers. Before business school, she had worked at a company that was trying to help students give them incentives to finish community college with the belief that it was gonna help hourly workers be on a path to a better job. And she had this just, this, he, she had built this incredible presentation on how many hour, hourly workers there were in, in the world and in America, and how little they were being served by society, right? They're just kind of on this treadmill trying to patch, to, patch together a living to pay the rent or to pay for food or electricity. And how she had this idea for basically putting together career boot camps for people to basically get off the couch, get the, get the courage to apply for a job that paid more per hour. How to do a LinkedIn, how to apply for a job, how to write a thank you note, basic things that, you know, if you're fortunate enough to go to a selective school, you kind of, you're around a lot of people who know, know that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, not a very, no clear product, really. She was basically running boot camps in strip malls. Uh, she had come up with at least, like, she was very entrepreneurial, so she would basically call, she would drive around and see, like, for rent signs and offer the landlord, you know, like 50 bucks to rent the space for a night, and then she would put ads on Craigslist saying, you know, are you feeling, like, you know, stressed out because you can't make, you know, you're just patching it together and you've, you've lost your mojo to kind of apply for a job, like, come to our career boot camp, we'll give you some practical skills. First it was free, then she charged $40 then she charged $80, and she basically would kind of A-B test and change the formula. So when we met her, she had probably done maybe six boot camps. And she, and she told us the story about how she was changing it every time. Um, so we met, and we had a really good meeting, and then we had a second meeting, and it was a bomb. Like, 
she was saying stuff that didn't make sense. I didn't really understand what she was saying. And like, basically, I would say maybe on a different day, I just would have passed. And a lot of people would have passed. But instead, I said, you know what? I really, I think she has something. Um, our first meeting was really good. I'm just going to call her and just tell her how I feel. So I called her and I was like, hey, I thought our first meeting was great. I don't know what happened in the second meeting. I just felt like we were talking past each other. And she's like, oh my god, I felt the same way. Can we have a do-over? And I said, yeah, let's meet again. So we met again. We had a do-over. We let her seed round. The company's called Guild Education. It's now worth $4 billion. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's what it's like being a venture capitalist. <laughs> that's, it's a great story, by the way, because we often worry about the oversampling for that final presentation. Mm -hmm. And, and the sort of part of the, the law is, well, if you can't present for that final presentation, how are you going to close business? How are you going to close mm -hmm. candidates? But then the converse is one bad day might just not be a good signal. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, I don't think I can follow that story. <laughs> I mean, but, part, but part of my, my reaction to these, both Rudolph and, and Aileen's stories, is, is to say that the great thing about being a writer is that you get to be a sort of tourist and you, you, you meet people who have these extraordinary experiences and you can kind of imbibe that culture for five years and then go off and tackle some new culture and, and discover a whole new set of, uh, of things. I, I, if I had to tell a story about my method, um, I'd say I'll take a story from the book I wrote before this one, a biography of Alan Greenspan called The Man Who Knew. And it's a story about sort of the how you get paid off, how you get paid and rewarded when you just go to a sort of stupidly extreme degree to collect information. So I was trying to figure out the culture of Alan Greenspan's consulting company in the 1960s when he was sort of emerging as a, a bit of a figure in New York. He was quite well off. He was just going into politics. So I, I found the, the address of the guy who had operated the punch card system for feeding the computer with, with punch cards. And he was in charge of the photocopying machines and all that. And I thought, well, this person will know something about the fire that burnt the office down in 1970. He will just have a sense of Greenspan as a person at the time. Um, so I drove uh, out of Washington, DC through Virginia to a clearing in the woods uh, and uh, went to this cabin where this man was living by himself. And um, you know, one of the things that had been in the back of my mind for a while is that Greenspan had this reputation for being a big devotee of Ayn Rand. But nobody had found the speeches, that, the transcripts of the speeches he had given when he was effectively the chief economist for this writer who believed there should not be a Federal Reserve. You know, she was a believer in the gold standard. There shouldn't be a central bank. Kind of funny when later Alan Greenspan becomes the embodiment of the central bank <laughs> for almost two decades. So I wanted to find this sort of set of speeches. And I'm talking to this guy about his punch card machine and his photocopying and all of that. And all of a sudden, he starts talking about Ayn Rand. So I say, hmm, so you like Ayn Rand? Yes, yes, I like Ayn Rand. I've got so many things you know, to do with Ayn Rand. I've got my, my basement is full of memorabilia. So I say, well, hmm, do you have by any chance the transcript of the speeches that Alan gave you know, in 1963. Oh, sure, he says. Well, could I have a copy? Yeah, of course, of course. And then I get this 300-page printout of the map of my subject's mind in a sort of far deeper way than I ever imagined I would capture. Uh, and in that 300 pages, as I read through them, I found the line, which was almost the best one I've ever discovered in my writing career, from the, imagine, the, the future chairman of the Federal Reserve who writes, the creation of the Federal Reserve was one of the greatest disasters in American history. <laughs> wow. wow. Um, uh, and I'm wow. left speechless. Uh, <laughs> so let's transition to the questions that we've gotten from the audience, and thank you for them. Uh, I would say the first batch here really has to do with um, venture capital and what might be called broader socioeconomic issues. There's, there are several questions around whether, um, well, I think this one puts it well, the basis of, the, of venture capital is the power law distribution, leading to fewer winners bringing in the largest of return. 
How can we make sure that venture capital will not lead to more inequality concentrating assets into the hands of the few? I'm happy to take that. Yeah. I don't think we can change the power law curve itself. And I was telling Sebastian yesterday that uh, I'd actually written a report internally at Sequoia in 2015. The title was Returns, but it was all about the power law curve. And in our case, uh, about 10% of our investments had accounted for 90%. So not quite an 80-20 rule, it's a 10-90 rule um, of our returns. And so I don't think you can undo that. Uh, what you can do is choose who your limited partners are. Whose money are you investing? And I wish this is a question that founders asked more often. Uh, it's obviously become a question in the last couple of weeks with what's happening in Eastern Europe. But at, at Sequoia, our, our investors, our limited partners are foundations, endowments, and nonprofits. So the Ford Foundation has been a client of ours longer than I've been alive. And so when we generate returns, the vast preponderance of it goes to them to fund medical research at the Cleveland Clinic or the Wellcome Trust or the Dana Farber Institute or to do this sort of environmental work or you know, just general poverty alleviation work of all these wonderful institutions. So I think that's one wonderful way to address this is choose whose money you are investing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think also um, when founders are raising money, who's on your cap table? Right, like, are you invite? Like, if, uh, now angel investors are so prevalent everywhere, right? And so I think, ten years ago, most angel investors were also kind of like talent mafia guys who are hooking up other guys. And I think now there are a lot of one of my colleagues at work has a list of over a hundred women and people of color who are angel investors, and she has a network of lots of VC firms. And so, not just with cowboy-backed portfolio companies, with other venture firms, when they want, when they have room for angels, they'll say, "Hey, send send this to all of the angels, so that you can actually invite a new set of people to invest in these companies, and then employees. Who are you hiring? What's the diversity and the composition of the company that you hire? Because working at a tech company, especially a high-growth one that becomes like Stripe or like PayPal, can be life-changing for the people who work there. So we have a lot of opportunity to actually change people's lives by who gets to work at tech companies. You know, one explanation of, of when I'm asked, you know, so what is the power law in, in, in a podcast or something, I often sort of make the point that if you think about, you know, a, an auditorium like this, um, you know, because the average American man is five feet, 10 inches tall, uh, and a really tall NBA player might be whatever, six foot 10 or something, it actually doesn't change the average of the residual man in the room if the NBA player at the back is incredibly bored by what I'm saying and he walks out because everybody's clustering around the average, right? Whereas if you think about wealth distribution, and the person at the back is you know, Jeff Bezos, and he walks out, I'm afraid the rest of your average wealth is going to collapse, right? So wealth is, is power law distributed in the society. Um, and the power law, as it operates in tech and venture investing, is contributing to that. I think there's no way around it. But I think there's a couple of things one can say about it in mitigation. One is the alien's point about opportunity. Um, you know, people sometimes say, maybe it's more a European thing than an American thing, but people say, well, so-and-so did really well in life. You know, they were, sure, they were intelligent, sure, they were hardworking, but you know what? They started with money and connections. And in some sense, a venture capitalist is somebody who, who, who meets a talented person and brings money and connections. In this sense, it's equalizing, right? Not perfectly equalizing, but it tends towards the spreading of opportunity to people on the basis of their talent and the supplying of those connections and that money that in some ancien regime they wouldn't have had because it would, you, know, you had to kind of be born with it. So I think that's a good thing. And Aileen's quite right that you know, disruptive companies that generate a lot of wealth for all the people who work there, and it's, it is actually statistically shown to be all the people. I mean, you know, even the junior people are being paid better than a junior person at an incumbent company. Why? Because when you're growing and you're creating massive value, there is such a downside if some younger member of your team is messing up and holding you back that you pay those people pretty well because you have to have the whole team moving super efficiently and it's worth it to do that when you're growing fast. So in insurgent companies spread opportunity to all the people within. The incumbents may lose out but the incumbents are the incumbents, and so it's creating mobility uh, in the distribution of, of income when you get disruption. Yeah. Super. 
and all the more reason to be widening the net and the people who are, are being pulled into these companies. Um, uh, there's another cluster of questions here around um, basically how do VCs and other institutional investors do due diligence? What's your thought process to determine if something is a good idea? A couple people are happy to share with you their backgrounds. Um, <laughs> uh, so can you, can you speak to that a little bit, please? Aileen, you want to um, start? Sure, I'll start. I mean, uh, I actually did a, a call today with a later stage investor who said it was, their model is team, product, and TAM, um, which was, I mean, that ours is similar, but we have other things as well. But we, you definitely want to look at the adjustable market or the potential market. You want to look at the product. We have a framework called um, people, product, potential, and plan. Uh, and so that's kind of how we think about it. And uh, hopefully those are somewhat self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add, Lisa? On the diligence point in particular? Which or either on, it's basically how do you make decisions about um, who to back? You know, it involves judgment. I mean, and Sebastian talked about it earlier that in the world of finance. I mean, at one point I was doing, you know, long-term option pricing using stochastic simulation techniques before I decided to join <laughs> PayPal. <laughs> so I, I sort of thought that branch of finance is super interesting. And I don't use any of those day to day in the job that I do today because you're evaluating things with so little information and you're trying to understand a person or these two people with their, with their idea and how silly it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of the time these great ideas, you know, are laughed at at the time. When, when we first invested oh. in Natero, when we first invested in Square at Dongle, when we first invested in YouTube, all these kind of people made fun of us. Um, made fun of me, and you need a thick skin. I remember being at PayPal and being mocked. There was a, a famous article that said, Earth to Palo Alto. So, so it's about the judgment of the individual and how crazy the idea may sound, but you know, if you imagine for a second, you know, a lot of the diligence that I think about is, put on your imagination cap. Yeah. And in our investment memos, we actually have a section that's a pre-parade and a pre-mortem. The pre-mortem is easy to write. You know, things go to hell, you lose all your money, it's fine. What is the pre-parade? If things go really well, what can you imagine this being? And honestly, with the winners, we're surprised to the upside. Can you imagine that something like this is used by a billion people around the planet one day? Right. Could never have guessed that. Um, but you have to imagine. Yeah, what if things go right? Is a, I think it's really easy for VCs to poke holes in things and think about all the things that could go wrong, but you really have to think about what could go right. Yeah, one of the phrases that Don had uh, when I he was still alive when I joined Sequoia and would hang around the office. And this he, is Don Valentine. Don Valentine, yes, the founder of Sequoia Capital. And he would, uh, who's a good friend of the Crown, like it was. Um, and Don would say, we're in the business of investing money. We're not in the business of not investing money. <laughs> 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 so yes, you could find yeah. all the reasons not to invest in every single company, but yeah. you have to find the reasons to invest. Yes. What, is it, what is it there that gives you reason to believe that this might amount to something interesting? Yeah, Eugene Kleiner would say you need to eat the hors d'oeuvres while That's they're being right. passed. That's you know, right. the, the same idea there for sure. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to ask you um, about the word that you wrote down. Um, there's a question here that is, I'm 23 years old. I want to change the world. I believe venture capital can do that. What advice would you have for me to be an effective venture capitalist. So I'm going to ask, you've been asked now, this is part of the museum's one word initiative, to write down a word of advice for a young person starting out in their career. And I think it was actually posed to you for entrepreneurs beginning in their career. And I'm gonna ask you to talk about that word and why you chose it. If also, you feel like, oh, I don't know if I'd apply this word to venture capital. That would be interesting to know if you see something different. Um, I'd just ask you to throw that in. So I'm just, I think I will start uh, with you, Rudolf. What um, was your one word, and why did you choose it? My word is dare. <laughs> you can see that. Um, there's a quote in Sebastian's book, and I'm not going to, I'm going to butcher the precise words, but it's something to the effect of, the, you know, the reasonable person fails at all the most important missions in life because they never even attempt them. 
And that to me is the crux, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an investor, an aspiring venture capitalist, dare, mm -hmm. go for it. You know, if you want to channel Hamilton's uh, play for us, or the musical for a second, you know, don't throw away your shot, just yeah. take a chance. You know, you'll never, you'll never amount to anything interesting and do something distinguished in your life if you do what everybody else has done. If you follow the conventional path, how could you expect to achieve a different outcome? And so that's what I, I recommend for people. And it's, you know, from a personal point of view, it, it, it took a dare for me to have studied actuarial science, then to switch profession after I qualified. I dared to move to a new country and start over and abandoned my family and all my connections. Um, I dared to join a, a crazy startup in Palo Alto that had no revenue in 2000, when I could have had a quote unquote safe job going back to consulting or something like that. I dared to join Sequoia when I had no idea that I'd, I'd work out as a venture capitalist when Meg Whitman offered me a compelling package to stay at PayPal. But in each of those crucible moments, I decided to do something that had far more upside, that had far more potential than the safe path. And Sebastian, what did you choose? I chose uh, curiosity. Um, I think it's just a great thing to be curious about the world, to always want to learn. Um, and partly it makes the world fun. Partly you may wind up discovering paths that you could follow that you wouldn't have thought of if you hadn't been so curious. And you may also learn more about yourself. Um, and that can make you happier. I love both of those. And Bring I, it home, Aileen. Um, so I chose serve. <laughs> um, so I am a tennis player. So, uh, so serving is how you start, right? You can't, uh, you can't start unless you serve. But I actually meant it more in terms of being of service to others. Um, I kind of, I'm encouraged when you were talking about Bob Noyce being the accidental. I'm an accidental founder and an accidental VC because I generally just like to work with other people and figure out how I can be of service to them. Uh, and I think it's a great way for VCs to find problems to solve um, and to be of service to founders. And like uh, doors have opened for me in my life because I've just done things that I thought would be of service to others. And I think good things happen when you do that. And it's a great way to learn. Well. I think that's uh, just an absolutely wonderful way to end. Um, can you join me in thanking the panel? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you all very, very, very much. Now, at CHM, we have a mission to decode technology the computing past, the digital present, and the future impact on humanity. How we go about that is curated conversations, curated conversations with care. You brought forward a conversation today with care and with personal stories. Um, Simon, you kicked it off about culture. Um, Silicon Valley may be about silicon and computing and software. Um, but it's really a state of mind, and part of that is the culture, and you brought an awful lot of it to the stage today. So thank you all so, so much. And thanks for doing what you do and participating in the program today. And thank you all for coming. Great. Thank you. Great.